kind of ominous, isn't it? <laughs> it's like the opener for like the like the HBO series or something. I don't know. Anyway, hey, my name's Alex, and I'm one of the pastors here at Fellowship Bible. And if you're visiting, we are super excited that you're here. Uh, we're starting a new series today, and so you picked a, a good Sunday uh, to come. And so we're glad you, that you're here, and we do hope that you'll let us know that you were here. Uh, speaking of uh, maybe new people, uh, about once a quarter, we like to introduce our newest um, members, is what a lot of churches call them. We call them partners around here, people who have partnered with our church on mission. And so I want to put this slide up. And if you're here, I'm not going to ask you to come forward. If your name is up here, would you just stand where you're at? These are people who've joined the church since the beginning of the year. I know some of you are here. Just stand up wherever you're at real quick. Okay, that's awesome. Thank you so much. The Griffins are back here. That's an awesome. We want to have the opportunity just to recognize people who are joining us on mission. And so thank you so much for standing for that brief moment. Um, Also want to uh, just give a quick shout out to our church family for inviting for Easter. We had a great Easter weekend last weekend. Um, Thanks for indulging me with some of the changes that we made to our Holy Week schedule. Uh, All in all, our staff teams talked about it and we we just thought it was a, a great weekend. We had over 600 uh, at, between both of our Easter services last week, lots of guests and visitors gave away lots of guest bags. And so thank you so much uh, for being a church family who uh, invites. Really appreciate that. Also want to let you know, if you haven't been around a long time, then you might not know that we started an associate pastor search way back in the fall around October, uh, September or October. And uh, our combined board of uh, deacons and elders made a decision about a month and a half ago to extend an invite to Clay Smith and his family, and they're here today. And so the Smith family is over here on the second row. Um, And they also brought with them uh, the outlaws, Um, Clay's parents. Jimmy and Cindy are here. They're going to be moving here with them. And so they were in town this weekend, house hunting, and both of them were able to find houses yesterday. And so that is a big answer to prayer. And so we're super excited. Yeah, that, that they're here. And uh, so, Clay, welcome. I'm glad you're here. Um, as I said today, we are starting uh, a brand new series called The Church, Culture, and Politics. Uh, and in this day and age, talking politics and church can be a difficult, uh, if not contentious, thing. And to be honest, it, it, my personal philosophy is I like to not mix the two. I, I, don't, I don't prefer mixing church and politics because I had a pastor one time tell me, when you mix church and politics, you always end up with politics. And, uh, and so I've just kind of always abided by that. But what, considering what's been happening in our culture... Over the last decade, with the discord and and dissension and division that's in our country, um, I want to do this series for a few reasons. One of those is I hope to be a spiritual voice of reason. Um, That's kind of the primary reason I want to do this series. Uh, I also think coming out of the Sermon on the Mount series that we just finished a couple of weeks ago, I think this is a natural follow-up. Like, how do we live kingdom lives? How, how do we live by some of the ways Jesus was teaching in his Sermon on the Mount? And what better way than when we have this intersect in our society and in our culture uh, between being Christ followers who live in a country that is so divided over politics? And so this just gives us a, a real good lens Uh, through which to maybe view the things that Jesus was teaching us in Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. That's another reason. Um, It's also a presidential election year. I'm not sure if you are aware of that. Um, (laughs) That's another reason that we're going to do this series, and I, I feel like I have a better chance of being heard in April than I do in September, October, when everyone's whipped into a frenzy. By then, it's too late. And so as I said last Sunday, here's the one promise that I'm going to make during this series. I promise to be an equal opportunity offender. And so who is ready to be offended? Okay, we are going to start with some generic like uh, terms. These are political terms, and this is called humor. And so I just... <laughs> 
I just need you to laugh with me over this, okay? So this is humor. We're going to put these up on the screen. Uh, what is a dictatorship? That's when you have two cows, the government takes both and shoots you, okay? That's a dictatorship. Socialism, you have two cows, the government takes one of your cows, gives it to your neighbor, and then somehow ends up with all the cows, and you wait in line for milk. What's capitalism? You all you entrepreneurs in the room, you have two cows, you lay one off, force the other cow to produce the milk of four cows, you're surprised when the cow drops dead. <laughs> yeah. You're laughing now. Somebody's feelings are about to get hurt. What's an American democracy? This is democracy American style, okay? The government promises to give you two cows if you vote for it. Lobbyists later ensure your cows end up in an industrial farm. And now, ugh, now someone's going to get hurt here. Let's talk about American democracy Democrat style. You have two cows, your neighbor has none, so you feel guilty for being rich. You vote politicians into office who tax your cows, forcing you to sell one to pay the tax. The politicians use the money to buy your neighbor a cow, okay? And then the Republicans. You have two cows, your neighbor has none, so you move to a new neighborhood. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hmm. Okay. Phew. You're laughing because it's true, and so... Anyway, we got to be able to laugh at ourselves through all of this. This is a, this is a tactic that pastors employ, knowing when we talk about difficult subjects, we got to apply a little bit of humor. Um, by the way, if you have any complaints during the series, you can write to <laughs> Clay S at longviewfbc.com. Welcome to the team, buddy. Okay. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, let's get into some content. One of the other things that I want to do each week, and I think this is important um, because our country has been whipped up into a frenzy, and I think there's a lot of things that we believe to be true that are are not true. And and so I want to, at least every week, kind of unravel one or two political myths, one or two political myths. And so um, these are things that you've been told are true but are not true. So here's the first one we're going to look at today. Um, This is the most important election of your lifetime. That is not true. It is only true if you're 18 years old and this is the first time you're going to vote. I've been hearing this. This upcoming presidential election will be my 10th presidential election to vote in. So for the last 36, 37 years, however long it's been, um, apparently everyone has been the most important election ever, which means if it's all true, then none of it's true. And so it's only true uh, if you're 18 and this is the first time you can vote. And listen, I am not looking to minimize the decisions that are facing our country right now. Uh, I'm just looking to minimize the rhetoric that's designed to whip us into this feverish pitch and make us feel like unless our candidate or our party wins, we're doomed, okay? So you're not. It's just not the most important election of your lifetime. Here's the second myth. Everybody's an extreme supporter of their political party. Uh, Some of us think that all the people who are on the other side of the aisle from us, so to speak, um, are wingnut extremists, and it is simply just not true. Um, In fact, there was a a nonpartisan group called More in Common that did a, a research, some vast research back in 2018, and they pulled people on their extreme views. And by extreme, by the way, it doesn't mean your political stance being extreme. It it, it is indicative of, hey, if you're on the liberal side or the conservative side, but these categories, 6% liberal extremists and 8% conservative extremists, what that means is those are people who are not willing to have a conversation with anyone on the other side at all, no matter what. Like, I'm just not interested. Like, it doesn't matter to me. Uh, we are not talking. You are my enemy, and I don't like you. And then when you move in a little bit to the traditional, um, so like 11% are traditional liberals and 19% are traditional conservatives, those are people, you're probably not going to change their mind, they're probably going to vote along party lines, but they might be, under certain circumstances, willing to have a conversation with you. And then everybody else falls into the majority, this 56% 
um, that is called the radical middle, or what the um, researchers referred to as the exhausted majority. <laughs> And what I really hope to do during this series is I hope to speak to that group of people. I hope to speak to the exhausted majority, which, by the way, I consider myself to be a part of. I want to try to help those of us who are frustrated um, with the discussion of politics uh, in America and, and the current narratives and, are, and just wondering, like, is, is there a better way? <laughs> it's like, is there a better way? Uh, to do politics than the way that we're doing them right now? Is there a better way to move our country forward? One of the big issues, however, is that whenever I talk about something like politics and democracy, I have to realize I have virtually nothing to work with from the Bible. And that is important to me because I'm a pastor. Um, neither America as a country or democracy as a form of government is really discussed in Scripture. Um, it doesn't mean that it's anti-biblical or non-biblical. It just means that it's extra-biblical, that the Bible authors just didn't think enough about democracy to really write a lot about it in Scripture. And so at best, we can say it's extra-biblical, or we can say there's some principles that are found in Scripture that resonate with democracy, such as government by consent or issues of justice and equality and um, concern for human dignity and rights and that sort of thing. But that's about it. Um, and so as we kick this series off today, and this may sound divisive, I want to challenge you today to identify exactly what side you are on. And I hope to show you this morning that there's more than two sides. And so if you have your Bible, would you turn with me to Joshua chapter 5? Joshua chapter 5, and because this is a topical series and we don't do these all the time, uh, we'll bounce around a, a little bit today, and, and, uh, but we're going to start and end in Joshua chapter 5. And if you're not familiar with the story of Joshua, you probably are familiar with a guy named Moses. Well, Joshua was Moses' assistant. Uh, he was also considered to be one of the great military leaders of the Bible. And in Joshua chapter 5, we see Joshua is dividing up the people between those who are with him and those who are against him. And, and that's what Republicans and Democrats are doing all the time, right? Who's on our side? Who's on their side, right? Who's with us? Who's against us? And Joshua is in this similar situation. He's brought the nation of Israel um, out of slavery, or at least the, the next leg of, of slavery after Moses has died. Um, they've crossed the Jordan River. They're now on the eve of their first major battle, and, and that's where we kind of pick up the scene. So this is Joshua chapter 5, beginning in verse 13, says this. By the way, just a quick time out. Uh, I, I'm going to read from the Christian Standard Bible. I've used the ESV for years, but, but I'm experimenting uh, with a new translation, the Christian Standard Bible. I've been using it in my quiet time a lot, and so for this series, since it's just four weeks, I'm going to read from that. So for those of you who are used to following along with me and I'm not reading word for word what you're reading, now you know why. This is the Christian Standard Bible. He says, When Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua approached him and asked, Are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied. I have now come as commander of the Lord's army. Then Joshua bowed with his face to the ground and asked him, What does my Lord want to say to his servant? Okay, pause. Notice that Joshua's paradigm is what most of our paradigm usually is, right? It's, it's good versus bad. It's us versus them. That's Joshua's paradigm. Are you with me? Are you against me? He sees a guy with a sword ready for battle. He simply wants to know which side are you on? Are you with me? Or are you going to help me fight the bad guys? And here's what's fascinating. Um, the angel says, neither. And he says, I'm on God's side. Here's the important lesson. As soon as you start to co-opt your agenda, your goals, your desires, and you start to wedge God into things that you want to see happen, um, you're outside the side of God. 
And so Joshua recognizes his mistake. He falls on his face. And this is an, an important like turning point for Joshua. And this can be a turning point for you and me as well. This becomes a turning point when we look to God and say, what would you ask of me, your servant? What do you want to say to me, your servant, instead of evaluating and judging other people based on their party affiliations? And so to be clear, not um, all views on a political platform are equally just before God. But as Christ followers, you and I need to be able to see, we need to be able to converse, we need to be able to interact, we need to be able to dialogue with different people who see things different from the way that we see them and don't buy into the rhetoric that extremists would have us buy into, okay? So your side or my side? In fact, Jesus interacted with a politician once. His name was, was Pontius Pilate. Um, Pilate was the politician who was overseeing the trial of Jesus. And you get to that position in Rome uh, um, or, or modern America by pandering to people and, uh, and catering to people and by doing things that get you noticed. And in this part of the narrative that we're about to read from the Gospel of John, Jesus is standing before this politician. Here's what it says, John chapter 18. Jesus is speaking. He says, my kingdom is not of this world. So again, what did the commander of the Lord's army, who was an angel, what did he say? He's like, I'm neither, right? There's another kingdom. Jesus is just repeating this. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I wouldn't be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. You are a king then, Pilate asked. You say that I am a king, Jesus replied. I was born for this, and I've come into the world for this, to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. So Jesus is saying, my kingdom is not a political realm. My kingdom isn't even of the land mass where Israel is. My, my kingdom isn't even where Rome is. My kingdom is the kingdom of God. Right? And so I'm not telling you anything you don't know. There is a way that those on the right view America. There is a way that those on the left view America. And then there's a whole different way that those who are in the kingdom of God or abide by the kingdom of God values, there's a way that they view America. And so let's talk a minute about this third way, okay? Let me give you a few examples. A new way, perhaps, that you haven't thought about before, a new way to view politics from a kingdom realm that's neither left nor right. And so I'm going to use a few examples. So the first one is this. Let's talk about American identity. If we were to ask the question, who is America? What is America? Well, those on the left would say America was founded on the ideals of freedom, opportunity, and equality as a communal melting pot to be a shining example to the world. Those on the right would say America was founded on the ideals of freedom, family, faith, and individual hard work to be a shining example to the world. The kingdom lens we love our country, but our identity in and loyalty to Jesus transcends our national allegiance. The church is to be a shining example to the world. Let me give you another example. Let's talk about um, whatever on the next slide is. We'll talk about that. The role of government. <laughs> Let's talk about the role of government for a minute, okay? So those on the left would say a protective government is the primary way to ensure freedom and justice for all. Conservatives would say intrusive government as the primary barrier to human freedom and flourishing. A kingdom lens. Government's a deeply flawed human system, but it's also a system God's used in the past and will use again in the future. It's made up of people. None of them are perfect. Here's the last one. What's the major problem in politics today? Liberals might say the regressive values of the past still promoted by the ignorant and the hateful are barricades to a flourishing society. 
Conservatives might say the rise of progressive pluralism fueled by those who hate America is the challenging is the challenging is challenging the values that made our nation the most prosperous nation in the world. Kingdom view. Every human and every human system is corrupted by sin. Sin causes us to place hope in earthly leaders and parties in which no final hope exists. Can you see how our country is at odds with one another? When if you don't choose the third way, you are just automatically pitted against the other. There doesn't seem to be a third way. I mean, I just don't know about you, but I experience more peace when I choose the kingdom lens than when I choose either left or right, when I choose Jesus as my king. And so quickly, in the time we've got remaining, I want to articulate three specific values of what it might look like in this day and age, to live this third way, to live the kingdom view. Three things that enable us as Christians to be different from the norm, okay? Here's number one. We choose people over politics. As Christ followers, we choose people over politics, okay? Jesus did not come to die for Republicans. He did not come to die for uh, Democrats. He did not come to die just for Americans. He came to die for everybody. Everybody around the world everyone. And every person who has an opposite political view of me is equally as loved by God as I am. Every last one. Even those who have an equal view. Those of us who share a kingdom view um, should always be more for people than we are for politics. I don't think God's really interested in us trying to find out which of the choices that have been presented to us are the right ones, and you just pick the lesser of two evils. I, I, I'm not sure he's interested in that. I don't think he's interested in us uh, being so well caught up on everything that we know how to prove everybody wrong. I think God is much more interested in trying to figure out how will his followers learn to get along with others. First Peter Five says this, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your cares on him because he cares about you. So, so let me just make a comment on that. Why does he care for you? He doesn't care for you because you're a political pundit. He cares for you because you are a person who was created in the image of God. And Jesus died for you. He also died for the person who thinks 100% different from you. And notice here in this passage, the key to this is humility. It says to humble ourselves. You know, the Republican Party will never tell you to do that. That's not one of the talking points, is it? Hey, just humble yourself. The Democrats don't say that. Hey, just humble. Because you know Why? Because it takes humility. It takes humility to sit down and have a conversation with somebody who's on the other side. And humility, by the way, isn't thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less and God and others more. Like, just go back to our Sermon on the Mount series. Like, what, whatever happened to praying for our enemies? I mean, Jesus made it clear what about loving your neighbor as yourself? Like, these are kingdom values. And so I just want to tell you, if your hope for peace and prosperity is, is in one of the two presidential candidates come fall, or the parties that they represent, you have no hope. Because they don't operate, they, like, they, they operate outside the kingdom. They, they don't have the ability to bring you peace. They just don't. God operates in God's kingdom, and he has a different constitution, and his is a constitution of humility. The second kingdom value is this. We choose personal impact over the power of parties. We choose personal impact over the power of parties. Um, let's be honest for a minute. Political parties are corporations, and they are designed to acquire resources and power, period, full stop, end of sentence. 
That's why they exist. That is why they always take the opposite view of the other. Because if they took the same view, they wouldn't get the power and the resources. So they have to take the opposing view. And then they go after the people who are on the opposite side to acquire the power and the resources. This is why they exist. That's why they're so polarizingly, and I think I just made up that word, polarizingly different. And so what those of us in the kingdom choose is we choose personal impact over political parties. We focus on our ability to make an impact to the individuals who are around us, right? That could be our family. That could be our neighbors. That could be our coworkers. We talk about kingdom things. We talk about kingdom values. Even when we layer in politics, it's like when someone asks you why you vote a certain way, then you've got to be confident that you know why you're taking whatever stand, and it should be a kingdom value. Recently, um, John Maxwell the former pastor turned leadership guru was speaking to a room full of pastors. This was just back in January. And he said this, the most important decision Christians make in 2024 isn't who they'll vote for, it's how they will behave. Um, here's the thing, okay? Whatever or whomever, like whatever platform, whatever party, whomever you vote for, it's, it's not going to be in the top most 50 important decisions that you're going to make in 2024. It's just not. The most important decisions are going to be things like, am I going to stop drinking too much? Am I going to stop turning to these other things in my life uh, to bring me comfort? Maybe these things that I'm addicted to, am I going to quit lusting, you know, after others? Am I going to quit looking at pornography? Am I going to learn to treat my neighbor how Jesus would have me? Like, you know, you could just keep going on and on and on and on. Am I going to actually pray? Am I going to spend time in God's word? Am I going to be generous with my resources? Am I going to stay committed to my spouse? Am I going to love my kids well? Those are the choices. Those are the decisions for personal impact that are going to lead to the change that you need to make in your life. Who you, who you vote for will not change your life to the degree that you've been told it will. It just isn't. And again, please hear me. Uh, I am not saying there isn't serious consequences to whomever is in power and whoever the president is. I'm just saying the consequences of your personal and spiritual life have far greater impact in your life on a number of any fronts. Again, I recognize I'm in a unique position when we start talking about like some specific issues that are happening in our country. I understand that there's some high stakes in the election. Again, I'm not trying to min minimize anything. I do not want to belittle that. I also want to say I recognize that I'm a 55-year-old white male who's in the prime earning years of his life. My life is really pretty good right now. Because of that, I understand that I am not discriminated against like some others. I understand that the country of origin of which I was born into is not really an issue for me, but it is for some other people. I understand that sexism is a problem, but I have never, as far as I know, ever been victimized for or, you know, or by my sex. But I still have to make the choice as to whether or not I'm going to be looking out for someone else's good, not just my own. Wh wh where am I going to place, you know, my peace? Whether or not I'm going to put my energy into changing people's lives or trying to change politics. Paul wrote in Colossians, he said, we proclaim him, warning and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Paul says, I labor for this, striving with his strength that works powerfully within me. 
And so what kind of toil, strength, struggle, energy do you and I have towards bringing people into the kingdom of God? What kind of toil and energy do you pour into growing in your faith in Christ versus the toil and energy that's going in to get somebody elected into a position of power? Your personal impact is going to be defined by all the other choices that you make in your life, not necessarily the one that you make in November. And then the last value is this. And this is so important. We get to have peace no matter what. We get to have peace no matter what. Are we to believe that followers of Jesus um, have never in history been able to find peace before democracy came along? Ever? No one ever. Are are we to believe that um, no citizens of the kingdom of God ever found peace until there was a president that believed all the right things and did all the right things? No. Followers of Jesus have been finding peace for centuries in countries where they live under a dictator and some of them are burned at the stake. I'm just saying you can have peace that is not influenced by what happens in America politically. This is actually a biblical promise. Let me read it to you. John 14. Jesus says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give you to you as the world gives. Don't let your heart be troubled or fearful. And so how does the world give peace? Uh, The world gives us peace the way political parties give us peace. If you will vote for me, I will offer you this. If you vote for me, this is what will happen. If you vote for the other guy, this is what will happen. That's how they, the world, promises you peace, right? If you elect this person, uh, we'll fix Social Security, uh, we're going to fix immigration, we're going to fix health care. Like, that's how the world gives. Jesus says, I don't give how the world gives. He says, things don't have to work out for you in order to experience peace. I can just give you peace. I can enable you to have your eyes set on me, a savior who loves you, no matter who the president is. And I can transcend every problem that's in your life. That's what brings us peace. And it doesn't matter what happens any place else in life, that peace is only forfeited if you and I choose to forfeit it. Nobody can take that from you. No president, no political party can take your peace unless you just hand it over. It's like, why in the world can we not understand this in the church? Like, why in the world is peace with those different from us so difficult for us? Let's jump back into the story of Joshua and figure out what happens next. Remember, the angel basically calls Joshua out by saying, no, I'm not on your side. I'm not on their side. I'm on God's side. And Joshua falls on his face and says, what does the Lord want you know, from me? What does the Lord want with his servant? This is Joshua 5, verse 15. The commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did that. I don't know if you've ever thought about this. I mean, I think lots of us have read this passage. And and it's like, what's going on here? Like, why is this ground holy? Is it because this was a little piece of God's real estate? Like it was a piece of God's property, and so that's what made the the ground like technically holy? Or because Joshua is in the presence of an angel? 
I mean, angels have appeared in front of people all throughout Scripture. And it's not every time. It's like, that's holy ground. Here's, I'm just going to tell you what I think. I think it's because Joshua has a self-aware moment. He has a heart change. And I think with that shift, that ground became holy. Because an impact was made in Joshua's life. It's now that Joshua realizes he's, he's asked the wrong question. The, the question was, really wasn't if the Lord was on Joshua's side. The proper question was Joshua on the Lord's side. Whenever there is a person that takes their eyes and their heart off of political platforms and people and puts it on God, that becomes holy ground. When someone makes that shift, either toward Jesus or back toward Jesus, that's holy ground. It's holy ground because spiritual change has taken place. And where spiritual change takes place, lasting change takes place. And so church, may we be people who choose to live our lives the way that, that Jesus taught us in the Sermon on the Mount. And may we choose kingdom values and may we choose the Lord's side. At FBC, we have a rhythm of receiving communion the first Sunday of the month. So I'm going to invite the servers, if they would, at this time to uh, begin to prepare the elements, and they're going to do that and come forward. Um, when Chuck gets back up here, I'll just try to explain this to you, but we're going to try something a little bit different today, okay? So in the past, you had to both grab a wafer from the center of the tray and the cup separately, and that's kind of hard to do when you need both hands. And so here's um, what we did. Chuck's coming. I just I want to show you. Um, we took a cup, and uh, so everything's double stacked here. So I, let me demonstrate. You're just going to grab a cup when it comes by, but it's really two cups. And so in the bottom cup is a cup with the wafer in it. And then we just stacked another cup on top of it and put the juice in it. Some of you are having like an, oh. <laughs> I wish I could take credit for this, but I can't. John Livingston, one of our deacons, was like, uh, we're going to try this. And then you should know my immediate thought was, well, isn't that the double the number of cups and crunches that we'll hear? Um, this will just make it a little bit more efficient, I think. So you can just with one hand grab the tray and then pick up. Just know that you're going to pick up two cups as everything's being passed. And then you'll just hang on uh, to those elements and we'll take them all together. And so as they're coming forward, uh, I just want you to also know that we practice at FBC what we call open communion, uh, which means the elements are available to all who have made a profession of faith. In Jesus Christ, you've believed upon his name for salvation, and so you don't have to be a member of our church. Um, and if you're here today and you have yet to um, give your life to Jesus or believe in him for salvation, we would just kindly ask that you let the tray pass. No one will think uh, anything of you. In fact, we're glad that you're here. We want to be a church that's reaching people who are far from God. Um, and, and so if you can't say that or you've got your kids with you and they haven't made that profession of faith, if you'll just uh, let the elements uh, pass you by and pass them on to the next person. And so with that instruction, let's prepare our hearts to receive communion. And in doing so, I just want to read to you the words from the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 11. He says, So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sin against the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself. In this way, let him eat the bread and drink from the cup. For whoever eats and drinks without recognizing the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. And so, as we begin to pass the elements, I want to give you just a moment where you're seated to examine uh, your heart and your mind. 
Also, if you're here this morning and you would prefer some gluten-free elements, uh, if you will just make your way to the back of the room to Mr. Livingston, uh, he has some elements back there, both the cup and the bread. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 10, he says, the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? And then he says, because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. And so the Lord's Supper, communion, offers us a special opportunity to remember Jesus Christ who suffered death upon the cross for our redemption, who by his sacrifice once and for all made a perfect and full payment for the sins of everyone in the world, in the past, in the present, in the future. So we remember so that we might follow the way of Jesus, uh, a path that he has set for us. And so we do this to just remind ourselves um, that we need to be people who are known for our fruit. And so in light of this, we now come to the table in obedience to continue a perpetual memory um, of his precious death until he comes again. On the night of his betrayal, he took the bread, and then when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, and he said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. And then in like manner, after supper, he took the cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink of this, all of you, for this is my blood, which is shed for the remission of of sins and establishing a new covenant. Covenant. Whenever you do this, remember me. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the wonderful sacrifice of Jesus upon the cross. We also thank you for giving us a perspective from your holy word that is timeless and relevant, 
now as it has been forever. So I just take a moment and pray for the state of politics here in our country, that things would calm down, that we would take time to listen to one another. I pray that you would rise up a generation of peacemakers, peacemakers in Congress and Senate and city councils, and that peacemakers would do their job, and that more of us would join the ranks of the peacemakers. And Jesus, we say to you, you are our king, and we are so thankful for you. And we pray these things according to the identity and character and according to the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Um, thank you for being here today. I, as we read our benediction in just a, a moment, if you'll take your cups out to the lobby uh, with you and simply throw them in the trash can, that'll help our deacons and our crew that'll be in here cleaning up after the service. I do want to invite you, if you're here today and you'd like to pray with someone at the conclusion of our service as we all stand, our, some of the members of our prayer team will come down front and be here, and so if you're here today and you just, man, you're dealing with something in life, you're struggling with something, and you just uh, need to pray with someone. There'll be someone down here uh, to greet you. And then I want to invite you back next week as we continue the series. And listen, I know it's uh, difficult. Um, you know, I can tell when the room gets silent. And, uh, and so I want to invite you back next week because I'm going to tell you how to vote. Um, so <laughs> that's true. I'm not going to tell you who to vote for, but I am going to tell you how to vote. So I hope you'll come back uh, for that next week. Would you stand as we read our benediction together? As God has forgiven our sins, let us go joyfully into God's world, offering God's love, forgiveness, and peace. Go in peace, and the peace of God goes with you. Amen. You're dismissed.